In the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. The text of our sermon this morning is our first lesson appointed for this Sunday. We read in Genesis chapter 3, verses 8 to 15. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The man said, The woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree, and I ate it. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. So the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, Cursed are you above all livestock and all wild animals. You will crawl on your belly, and you will eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. This is God's word. In the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, dear fellow redeemed. Last week, my three granddaughters, with Nana's help, built a fairy garden. Their imaginations created this beautiful environment for those little fairies, even though they built it in an old wash tub filled with dirt. Some of you have heard me relate the incident where a Lutheran pastor of a different synod related to me that he had some of his children in confirmation class who still believed that Adam and Eve were real people, and he didn't discourage them from believing that. He believed that the Genesis account, pretty much all of the Old Testament, was really just the creation of somebody's imagination. A nice story to relate. Sort of a parable about the difference between good and evil. For this sad man, Moses' account of the fall into sin and the consequences of the fall into sin and the solution to the fall into sin were not any different than what three little girls did in their backyard. By God's grace, my granddaughters know the difference between fantasy and reality. By God's grace, you and I know the difference, don't we? We know that the fall was a fall into real sin. And that real sin brings real consequences. And we also know that God in eternity prepared the real solution to deliver us from those consequences. This morning, on the basis of this theme, we see God seeking love saves all hiding sinners. See, first of all, that God's love is gracious. And secondly, we'll see that it is all-inclusive. At times in the Garden of Eden, when God wanted to speak to Adam and Eve, he would take the form of a human being and appear to them. We call that a theophany. And even after the fall into sin, God would appear to Adam and Eve in that form he did here, right for the first time after the fall into sin, 
And that's why Adam and Eve were able to hear God walking in the cool of the day in the Garden of Eden. So even after Eve and then her husband decided, we're going to live our lives independently of God and his love and his will. After all, isn't that what sin is? God still contacted them. He still reached out to them. He still walked among them. Things were different now, however. Adam and Eve, instead of running out to meet the Lord and stand in his presence, instead of eagerly desiring to hear his word and to worship him, Moses said, they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Their iniquity now separated them from God. And that would be true for every generation of their children up until the end of time. Sin had replaced innocence and a longing to hear God's word and stand in his presence. A longing to stand before the face of God in his shining radiance of love was now replaced by fear and trembling and the foolish idea that you can actually hide from God simply by standing in the midst of a bunch of trees. How foolish to think that we can hide from God, that we can somehow escape his wrath and punishment. How foolish those people who think, I'll just be cremated after I die. And I'll have my ashes scattered to the four winds. And then God won't, if there is a God, won't be able to find me. But I don't want to take any chances. Sin blinds us so completely that we act like little children who had done wrong. Well, I'll just step behind the couch, and mom and dad won't be able to find me. Or, well, I'll close my eyes, and then mom and dad won't be able to see me or know where I am. Sin and fear and guilt blinded Adam and Eve also to the fact that they were not dead. God told them, when you eat of the tree of the fruit that I told you not to, you will surely die. But it didn't occur to Adam and Eve that that hadn't happened. It didn't occur to them that the Lord, the God of all grace and mercy, their God who created them, had given them a time of grace for them to acknowledge their sin and to rely on that love that he had shown for them by making them in his image. Moses refers to the Lord, the Tetragrammaton, the God of all grace, God, as the one who sought them out. God's seeking love saves all hiding sinners. In that time of grace that God gave to them, God sought them out. With his mercy. The Lord sought out Adam. God knew full well where Adam was hiding. He didn't ask Adam where he was because he didn't know. He asked him so Adam would step out and say, I'm right here and I have sinned against you. Adam did step out and he did make a bold acknowledgement of everything except his sinning against God. Adam did, as we often do, being his children, and like him, we acknowledge the consequences of sin. Adam said, I was naked, guilt, so I hid, guilt. 
He was afraid of God. That's why he was hiding. He had shame, which is why that he and Eve had covered himself. So he confessed his fear, he confessed his shame, and he confessed his guilt. But he didn't confess the reason why he now had those things in his life. He simply said, I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. Isn't it true that it's the lie of the devil that it's easier to live with fear and shame and guilt rather than stepping out and confessing that to the God we know loves us, the God we know forgives us even though we offend him with our sins. We know that God's love is gracious. It is undeserved. It comes from him who is love. More than once, God called Adam to confess his sin. The second time, Adam didn't confess his sin either. Along with fear and shame and guilt, he added that all-time favorite blame. God, the woman you gave me, gave me that fruit to eat. It's your fault that I did this. And it's the woman's fault because she gave me this fruit to eat. So then God turned to Adam's wife, to the woman. But she didn't take responsibility for sin either. She blamed Satan, who had taken the visible form of a serpent. Eve tried to claim deception. She tried to claim that that she was somehow overpowered by temptation. The serpent deceived me, and I ate. The same Eve who had taken the desire to be in control of her own life now suddenly claims she didn't have any control over her life. And it wasn't her fault that this happened. This is the sad, real account of the fall into sin, and it is the sad, real account of your life and mine. A life of fear and shame and guilt and blame and denial. That's our natural old Adam that lives in us. We would rather try foolishly to live with all of those or to somehow try to numb ourselves to those or to try to hide from those by nature rather than to admit them to God. There is nothing else we can do by nature because we are totally and completely depraved in our old Adam. Yet, what does God do? God saves, God's seeking love saves all hiding sinners. That love is His grace to us. That love is His seeking us out in the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is the call of the Holy Spirit to repent. And to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved. God's seeking love saves us, even as we try to hide from him. God had planned and carried out and provided the solution, the real solution, to the real fall into sin, to the real consequences of sin, already In eternity, in eternity, God determined to send his son into the flesh to be our redeemer, to be the second Adam. For by one man's sin, we are damned. And so by one man's righteousness, by Christ's righteousness, God has declared the whole world not guilty of sin. 
God has justified all hiding sinners. That gracious love of God is all-inclusive. It is meant, it is offered to all. Every generation of Adam and Eve who live until the end of time. It comes to us while God may be found in our time of grace. You all and I sinned this morning already, and God didn't strike us dead. But God gave us a continuing time of grace to know him as our Savior and to have that faith strengthened in us by the means of grace. God then turned to Satan and judged him and condemned him, had ended his brief reign over man with his word. I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring or seed and hers, and her seed, her her offspring would crush your head, will crush your head, and you will bruise his heel. This is what happens when the Holy Spirit calls and brings us to faith. He creates enmity between us and Satan. Adam and Eve now were Satan's friends. There wasn't any enemy enmity between man and Satan. They had listened to him. They had followed him. They said, we'll listen to you rather than God. And do your will rather than his. God said, no, I'm going to end that friendship right now. And I'm going to put enmity between Eve and her children, believers in me, whom the Spirit brings to faith, and your offspring, unbelievers, and the other demons. No longer will there be that friendship between these sinners and you as I bring them to faith and create that enmity, that war, that division between my children through Eve and Satan. As believers, we are at war with Satan. We are Eve's collective children as believers, warring against Satan's collective offspring, all demons and unbelievers. But one of Eve's seed, one of Eve's offspring, would come with a special work. And God gives that promise in what we call the pro-evangel, the first gospel, Genesis 3.15. God promised lost mankind through our real parents the real solution for the real results and consequences of our sin. And that is our forgiveness, our salvation, our relief from the power of the devil in our lives. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. Jesus Christ, the Son of God and Son of Mary, would destroy Satan's power by dying for us on the cross. His Father would declare his victory, our victory, by raising his Son, Jesus from the dead, giving him that reign over all things for the sake of the church. Yes, Satan would strike the heel of Jesus. He would bring about Jesus' suffering and death on the cross. But he would not have victory over Jesus. He would not have Jesus suffer eternally or not pay for what we did. And so already in that promise of Jesus' eternal suffering and death on the cross, in the offer of the sacrifice of his righteousness, Satan's power was ended. How were Adam and Eve saved? By faith. Just like you and me. They believed in that promise of the Savior to come, We believe in the promise of the Savior who has come. Salvation is yours and mine in the fulfillment of that real solution for those real problems. We are 
real people. We have real sin. And that real sin brings real consequences of fear and shame and guilt and blame and denial into our lives. And sometimes still we foolishly try to hide. But God's seeking love saves all hiding sinners. God's love in the gospel of Jesus Christ seeks us out and it finds us and it forgives us. We have a real promise in Jesus Christ who bore our transgressions. By his real wounds we are healed. Because Jesus really lives, we really live. Not only in peace now, but eternally in heaven. Sin and salvation are not some vague general concepts pictured in a theological fairy garden that someone's imagination created and wrote down. Real sin in Adam, real salvation in Jesus Christ, both belong to us. They took place in a real garden, real gardens, the Garden of Eden, in the Garden of Calvary. And what they mean for us is really this. I don't have to hide. And I won't hide. Because I rely on Christ when I step out and fully trust in God-seeking love that has saved me. Amen.